All right, guys, I'm recording this. I forgot to turn it on, so that didn't get on the tape. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to be starting the, uh, the chapter on Karma Yoga. And uh, has anybody uh, read this chapter? Anybody read through this chapter? This is a very, very, have you read it, Corey? Version. <laughs> Say it again. On the children's book version, yes. <laughs> well, this, this, this particular chapter is a fun chapter because it gives us an opportunity to change the trajectory of our lives. So whatever it is we're experiencing now, is the result of our previous karmic reaction, right? So we are the actual painters uh, on a canvas, a blank canvas of our life. And we can choose whatever future we desire. By our actions and by our choices, we can fall down into the material pool and experience great suffering. By our actions, we can remain in this human situation, in the mode of passion, and we can create in this material world from unlimited varieties, literally for time immemorial. And we've had unlimited births, unlimited deaths. And we're still here looking for something. Some people think that what we're looking for is to go to the heavenly planets. As a matter of fact, in the Vedic literature, karma kanda, or the worship of the demigods particularly, are designed to take you to the planets of the demigods, where there is elongated life, unlimited pleasures, unlimited varieties of pleasure in a heavenly environment. Unfortunately, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka, Loko Mankarma Bandana. In other words, it doesn't matter where you go from the highest to the lowest of planets within the material world, all are places of misery wherein repeated birth and death take place. Now, when I was a young person, death was so far away and old age was so far away and disease was so far away, I never even thought about it. I thought, well, no, I mean, I'm going to live forever, right? <laughs> I had this feeling that, no, I would live forever. And that, you know, death is for others. It's for old people. It's for people not like me. But the fact of the matter is, is we've already experienced unlimited uh, repeated births and deaths and we're still not satisfied. So we're looking for something, aren't we? What do you think it is? Anybody have any idea what it is we're looking for? Please chime in if you can think of what you what, what it is that we're really after. Yeah. God. What is it? God? Did someone say God? Yeah. Okay. All right, God. All right, that's good. Anything else? I heard love. Something? I guess love. Love. Okay. All right. Okay. Purpose. Both of those are, are actually correct. So God is love. As a matter of fact, you can read that in the Bible. God is love, and we know that from the tenth canto, Shrimad Bhagavatam, that God is is love, and all of the things that we experience here are a result of God's love for you. We may have left God to come here to a dark world, but God never left us. He's there within the heart as the super soul, witnessing every activity and nudging us in the right direction as a voice of conscience, the voice of the Shastra, the voice of the guru, the voice of the sadhu, and within your own heart, you can hear the voice of the super soul. So we know what is right and wrong, but we ignore it. We ignore it in our lives. And what happens is, is we reap the fruit of our activity over and over and over and over again. And we can do this forever, literally. 
God is so kind, he'll give you unlimited opportunities. You know, I remember I was in a religion where uh, previously, where it said, or a denomination, I should say, where it said that you have one chance and then you either get it right this time or you burn in hell forever. You got one shot. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I mean, is God not even as kind as my own mother or my teacher at school? Is the teacher at school superior to God in compassion and love? How could that be? We're all just sparks of God. <laughs> so it didn't make any sense that you only have one shot to get it right. So Krishna's so kind that he gives you unlimited opportunities to come back home. But somehow or another, it's like this. If you ever been at the airport and you're, you're thinking, I've got a flight to catch in just a little bit. Okay, that's indicative of death coming. You've got a flight to catch. It's going to be here in a little bit. Are we? To, the flight is scheduled, believe me. So, but you get distracted and you go over and you're looking in a store, you get to talking to somebody, you meet some nice people, you get in a conversation, maybe you're playing a game on something or, you know, reading something and, and the flight passes and you miss the flight. Is that ever, is that ever happened to anybody? <laughs> exactly. So what happens is, is we're dilly dallying in the material world. <laughs> And we're thinking, oh, this will bring me pleasure. Oh, this person will actually bring me the ultimate satisfaction. Oh, if I just had more of this or food or more money or more sex life or more power or more fame, if I could just be famous, then I'd truly be happy. If I could just become famous. <laughs> if I had a bunch of fans, followers, then I could be satisfied. No, none of those things will bring the ultimate satisfaction. And ultimately, we're dilly-dallying with these little sparks of God's splendor, so to speak, and we miss the flight. We miss the flight back home, back to God. But somehow or another, you guys are here. You're here. And you're hearing from Krishna's Bhagavad Gita. You're hearing his direct directions to you on how to not miss that flight. As a matter of fact, in the last chapter, you might remember Krishna was saying that if one, let's see what that last verse is. I'll quote it to you. So he explains to live free from the desires for these illusory sense gratifications. To live free from the sense of proprietorship in the world that you own this place. This is your money. It's your house. Your car. Right? It's your family. Right? You're looking good while you're doing it. Right? <laughs> he says live free from all that proprietorship. Give that up. Be void of sense of false ego. That false ego that I'm the center of the universe. That everything revolves around me. Right? That this is mine. I and mine. Those are the diseased false ego speaking to you. None of this is yours. It was here before you got here. It's going to be here after you're gone. Thousands of generations prior to you have been here. Thousands more will come later. Right? So it's not yours. So Krishna says, if you do these things, if, if you give up these desires in the material world for proprietorship, for sense gratification, for false ego, only then can you attain real peace. And that is the way of the spiritual and the godly life. After attaining which one is no longer bewildered. And if one is thus situated in that consciousness, even at the hour of death, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Guys, that's strong stuff. I mean, we need to be shouting this from the rooftops, literally. Because 
everybody is walking down the primrose path and there's a big abyss there at the end and they're lost, they're distracted and they go over the cliff and dashed amongst the stones repeatedly. And by the way, karma means that there is an opposite and equal reaction for every act that you perform. So think about that. Think about that. And if you think about that very seriously in a very meditative, deep state, you'll realize just how intricate karma can be. Karma can be the most intricate thing you could ever imagine. So when Arjuna was talking to Krishna, he asked him, he says, uh, why do you, why do you encourage me to engage in this ghastly warfare? If you think that intelligence is better than fruit of work. Remember he was saying that there are some people who are prone to philosophical empirical knowledge, right? Those are called jnanis, jnana yoga. You're familiar with that, right? Jnana, yoga of wisdom, knowledge, like that. Some people are attracted to that, while others are attracted to devotional service. Now, devotional service is um, the easiest way back home. And if we look at the life of, say, the gopis, for an example, they weren't great sages. They hadn't studied the book. Well, they may have been in previous lives. Okay. But at that time in Gokula Vrindavan, they were just Aborigine cowherd girls. And they were so overwhelmed with love for Krishna that they were superior to even those Gyanis and those sages who were immersed in all the Vedic literature, all the scriptures, all the Puranas like that. Okay, because they had achieved the ultimate goal of life, which is that what you just mentioned a moment ago, that ultimate love that we're missing right now. We've all loved, quote, loved, and we've all lost. Right. I mean, it, you, it, I mean I'm sure if we sit here for the next three, three, four weeks, we could all just cry in our soup about those things, because those were things that we were attached to through our senses, our sense gratification, that we believed that would give us the ultimate happiness. And when it didn't, what did we do? We got frustrated. We got angry, didn't we? We got angry, we became offensive in some cases, and others became offensive to us. So, so Krishna, so Arjuna is asking Krishna, please then tell me, which is therefore decisively the most beneficial thing I could be doing. What is it? Is it jnana yoga? Or is it karma yoga? Or is it karma yoga, which leads to bhakti yoga or that renunciation of the fruits of work in devotion? So let's see what he says. So Krishna describes to Arjuna, and I'm going to have to read a few of these verses to you because there's no way around it. Uh, this is a beautiful chapter, and everybody should read it over and over and over again. Or you can go to Prabhupadvani.org, and you can listen to Amala Bhakta read it to you in a dramatic reading. It's quite entertaining. So he says, um, uh, not by merely abstaining from work could you achieve freedom from reaction." nor by renunciation alone can you attain perfection. Now, all right, has anybody ever heard of the religion, the Jains? J-A-I-N-S, right? Well, they sweep the, the sidewalk, did you know that, wherever they walk. They don't start fires because they're afraid of their karmic reaction of killing the living entities that might be in the fire or they might step on something, right? Is that working out? Is that going to... Is that going to work out? No. And the reason it's not going to work out is because just by breathing, just by drinking water, just by living in the world, you are literally killing unlimited amounts of living entities. So there's a karmic reaction for that. So you can create a religion that you try to become free from. Has anybody ever heard of Buddhism? Right? So they renounce 
see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, like that. They even take vows of silence. And it, why? They're renouncing activities. They don't want karma. They don't want any karma. And they think by renouncing the activities, they can be free from karma. But right here, Krishna says, not merely by abstaining from work can you achieve freedom from your reactions. They're still killing. They're having to offer the one bowl of rice a day that's un unspiced. They still get the one bowl of rice. They're still kill killing living entities. So what's the solution? How do you get out of this situation? Because Krishna says that everyone is forced to act helplessly. No one can be inactive even for a moment. Not even for a moment. So you may say, oh, I'm going to merge with God. I'm going to be a, an atom in the light of, of God's body in the Brahma Jyoti. And that's the realization of impersonal Brahman. Uh, and that is um, one aspect of God, no doubt. It's the eternal realization, uh, realization of eternality. But because you can't be still for a moment, you still fall down back to the material world. Okay. And by the way, this place is a razor's edge. It's a razor's edge because one little false move and you get cut. And that's at your own um, device. You're doing that to yourself. So now Krishna then says, so that if a person just restrains their senses from action, trying not to do anything wrong, but in their mind, they're still dwelling on the sense objects that they are then deluding themselves and are known as a pretender. We're pretending, guys. So this, all this renunciation that we see with these sadhus who've given up this, given up, given up that, if they're thinking about it in their mind, Jesus Christ even said, look, I'd say that even if you think about it, you're committing a sinful act. So even if you're thinking about those things, you're committing a sinful act. That's in the Bible. So what we're saying is, is there's no relief from karmic retribution without yoga in karma, karma yoga, action, and giving the fruit of all activities back to God where it all came from. That creates a perfect circle, a 360 connection with God. So Krishna says, you should perform your own, you should perform work. If you're sincere and you try to control your uh, senses by the mind and you begin karma yoga without attachment, it's going to be far superior. Now, text 9 is one of the most important verses in my mind in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada used to quote this verse all the time. And the verse is, Yajartat karma non yatra, loko yam karma bandana, tadartam karma konteya, mukta sangha samachara. So if you read that, you'll see that work done <coughs> as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. That's text 9, chapter 3. Yartat karma non yatra loko yam karma bandana. So work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, it will bind one to the material world. So he recommends to Arjuna that he should perform his duties for God's satisfaction. And in that way, always remain free from bondage. Now, the other day in chapter 2, I gave an example of a military man going to war and killing thousands of people, coming home, and he's a hero. He did it for his country, and he did a great job. Comes back home thinking killing's a good thing, goes out and kills a couple people on his own volition. Now he's in the electric chair. You get it? So work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be done. Otherwise, you're bound to the material world. Excuse me, guys. I got a kind of a sore throat. Apologize. So the, the word sacrifice 
Jagya, sacrifice. We are meant for sacrifice. And what is sacrifice? Think about it. Sacrifice is that I do something for you instead of just for me. It's that I use the money I have for the benefit. I offer it to God for his will. I offer whatever fame I have. I give that to God for his will. Just like we, we've seen these big sports uh, stars at the end of the thing. They're given the big trophy and they go out with all to God. That's karma-free activity. Because they've dedicated the fruit of their fame to God. And... You could do that with power. We've seen politicians who have said that it's all about God. We just recently, I saw a video of the, I guess, Miss Universe. And one of the questions was, <clears throat> if you had to change your religion or give up your religion to marry the person you love. Now listen to this, y'all. <laughs> if you had to give up your religion to marry the purpose that you, the person that you love, would you do it? And the girl, absolutely beautiful girl said, absolutely not. Because my first love is to God, the one who created me. And if the actual person who says they love me, love me, they will also love my God. <laughs> I thought that's pretty karma free. That's a pretty karma free statement. <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? So let's say you have a beautiful family. Let's say you've got the most beautiful children. I just went to see my grandkids. I, I wish I could show you some pictures of my little three-year-old uh, grandchild. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's just so, he's so beautiful. It's just a miracle of God, isn't it? These little children, how innocent, wonderful they are. And when we see them, we just break up and sigh. But I told his father, I said, are you educating the boy from childhood in the ways of sacrifice, giving his life to God? I ask him that. Are you doing that? Because otherwise, another wasted life, what are you going to do with a wasted life? How many of those you already got? You got a closet full. You got shelves full of trophies about how excellent you were wasting your lives. Oh, look, I see a picture of my body he's putting up of a little baby. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. So give your family to God. Give it to God and sacrifice. That's karma yoga. Actually, it's bhakti yoga. Karma yoga leads to bhakti yoga. If you renounce everything and give it to God, gradually you'll develop love for God. Because the idea is, is this. You got something. Where'd you get it? Where'd you get it at? Where'd it come from? <laughs> Who is the sponsor of your wealth? Who is the true sponsor of your life, of the air, of the food you, you eat, of the sky, of the sun, of the beautiful aromas? Who is the sponsor? Who's giving you all that? The very body you live in, the energy that you subsist on, the breath of life which creates the energy in your body. Who gave you that? No one can say, oh, well, I created it. Or my parents created it. I mean, that would be foolish nonsense to even say such a crazy thing. <laughs> Who would say that, right? So the point is, is that it comes from God. All of it, everything. So acts of sacrifice means I give it back. <laughs> I recognize you, God. I thank you, God. I'm grateful to you, God. Thank you for everything. Here, let me offer it to you. Let me make you something nice. Let me go pick a flower and offer it to you. Just like if you love another person, you're wanting to do things for them. You can't help yourself. So work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, it will bind you to the world and to another life. So... The devotees of the Lord, this is text 13. The devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sinful reaction because they eat food which is offered first for sacrifice. 
And if you're looking at that verse, Susan, would you read the rest of that verse to us? Others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. Think about that, you guys. Verily eat only sin. And what is sin? Sin is reaction for activity that you've performed that is adverse to your well-being. Right? Think about it. it. It's adverse to your happiness. It's adverse to your well-being. And it's against nature. Sins against nature. We've heard of that. So in, in our Christian background, we feel guilt. You know, oh, sin, I'm going to burn in hell forever. I'll never get out. You know, like that. But the fact of the matter is, whatever you do, you're going to get a reaction for it. So watch what you're doing. Learn the regulative principles of freedom and act in accordance with your intelligence, free from false ego, free from the influence of the mind, attracted to the sense objects. Just rushing after them like a moth to the flame over and over and over and over and over again. Yes, okay, feels good for a minute. And then what? Now you're implicated in the sinful reaction. So this is a very, 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 very important verse here. The devotees of the Lord, those who are devoted to the Lord, are released from all kinds of negative reaction, sinful reaction, or any kind of reaction because they eat food which is offered for sacrifice to the Lord. Others who pair, prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. And by the way, people are eating all kinds of disgusting stuff. And they think it's good. I saw a video and my son was showing it to me. And I, thought, oh, I can't stand to see it. That lady had gotten a squid and had bit or an octopus, put it in her mouth and bit it. And all this blue stuff blows. I mean, what, how can that be pleasurable? Has no one advised her that there's an action, a reaction to that action? Has no one told her that? Someone has to tell it. Will it be you? Somebody has to. It's like we were reading the Ramayan recently, and Sita was entrapped by Ravan's lust. He wanted to enjoy her body, stole her away. Married woman, stole her away, tried to enjoy her body. And she wouldn't allow it. And she asked him, she said, has no one given you good counsel? Is there no one here that would tell you the truth uh -huh. that your activities are going to bind you to hellish reactions? Is there no one who would come forward to tell you these truths? So see, our situation is we're here to come forward to tell you these truths because it, it's been ordered by our spiritual master. Prabhupada said, you go out and tell people. Don't pull no punches. Tell them the truth. That's what we're here to do. It's not that everybody's going to like it. Hey, right? I mean, what are we going to do about that? The truth always hurts. But we need to know the truth because the truth will set you free. Bada bang, bada boom. Okay? And freedom means no more death, no more disease, no more old age, jara. Who wants it? Who wants it? You can come back here and have as much of it as you want, or you can perform sacrifice. So sacrifice means use, use your money, use your talent, use your words, offer your food, do something for God. He's doing everything for you. Do something back for God. So um, Krishna goes on to tell Arjuna, one who does not follow in human life, the cycle of sacrifice thus established by the Vedas certainly leaves a whole life full of sin. And living only for the satisfaction of the senses, such a person lives in vain. Now, satisfaction of the senses is going to happen naturally by your sacrifice, by your devotional service. Has anybody ever been to a temple where they're feasting and dancing and singing? <laughs> What are we missing out on? Okay. <laughs>
people are beautifully decorated. There's beautiful children running around, beautiful families. Everybody's devoted and everything to God. It's beautiful. What are we missing? So we could hide in the dark and try to enjoy some perverse concept of sense gratification. And then what would happen is, is we would live another life in vain. But we've already done that, haven't we? Millions of times. And we're still looking for that one true love. <laughs> well, guess what? It's here. It's here for you. It's here for you now. It's been brought from the East to the West by Srila Prabhupada. And he's given us this information. And all we have to do is digest it, assimilate it, and live in accordance to it. And then we will, even at the hour of death, be transferred to the eternal spiritual world where our bodies are sat, chit, ananda, vigraha. Adibo. <laughs> Adibo. Sat, chit, ananda, vigraha. Eternal full of bliss, full of knowledge, with beautiful, unlimited form of blooming youth. So here, Krishna goes on to say, a person who's self-realized really has no purpose here to fulfill in discharging their prescribed duties, doesn't have any reason to perform them or not to perform them, doesn't have anybody he's dependent on. He's not dependent on any other living being. He gives himself to God and goes, hey, whatever you want from me, I'm willing to accept. And in the previous chapter, we read, Matra sparsas to kontaya sitosna sukadukada agamapayano nichas tongues to teach us for about a time. It's going to be cold sometimes. It's going to be hot. We're going to be victorious sometimes. Sometimes we're going to experience loss. So what? Uh, so what? Get over it. Don't be disturbed by these things. This is the material modes interacting with the material body. And guess what? You're not even the doer. You think you're doing something. Krishna's doing everything. Move your right arm right now. Move it. See, move that right arm. Feel that right arm moving? Yeah. You're doing that, right? Ah, uh ah. -uh. <laughs> you don't know how that's happening. Anybody have some dinner? You had a little dinner? Is it digesting? You're doing it, right? It's all you, right? You got it all figured out. You're making it turn into energy. You're doing all that, right? No. So therefore, get over yourself and get over the material world and realize you are the spirit soul. You're not, this is not you. This is a place of illusion. This is a, this is a dream world. And it's your dream. He has to leave us now. Who has to? Denise. Oh, Denise. Well, we'll we'll record this for you where you can catch it later. Okay. We're so happy you were with us today. Thank you. We appreciate you so much for coming. So Krishna even goes on to say in this chapter that there's no work prescribed for him within all of the three worlds. He's not in want of anything. He doesn't need anything. There's no need to obtain anything. He already has everything. But still, he's engaged in acts of sacrifice. Because if he didn't, if he ever failed to engage in carefully performing his duty, certainly all men would follow. And he would then be um, responsible for putting all these three worlds into ruination. He would destroy the peace of all living beings. And he would be responsible for creating so much unwanted progeny due to unbridled activities. So, um, the, the point that I'm wanting you guys to walk away with today and there's a couple more points that I want to make with, with this as well. But one of the main points that I want to say to you is, is that if you look at the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Ramayana, if you look at any of the activities of God, you'll see that they are perfect, that they're designed for the benefits of all living entities. Everyone benefits. Even if he kills a demon, the demon is liberated. So everything God does is good. 
And we are parts and parcels of that same God. There's only one. And so you can be godly. It's called a chinta beta beta tava. You're not going to be God in quantity, but you're going to be God in quality. And you can be elevated back to the spiritual sky where you can live an unlimited life of happiness and pleasure beyond anything you can imagine within the material world. But you're going to need to understand this first principle of karma. You're going to need to understand that you are going to have to pull it together. Now, the big issue here, Arjuna brings it up on text 35. Wait just a minute. No, it's on, uh, which one is it? Okay. Wait a minute. Where is it at? I just had it. Arjuna brings it up. Hmm. Which one is that where he says, uh, it's lust only? Let's, let's move on. Oh, here it is. So Arjuna says, text 36. I had it right in front of me. This shows you what old age will do to you. <laughs> All right, it says, Arjuna said, O descendant of Vrishni, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? So the Supreme Personality of Godhead said it is lust only, Arjuna, which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath, in which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. Now, we're running over a few minutes, but I wanted to cover this very quickly with you because this is a huge portion of this Karma Yoga chapter. So Krishna goes on to say, as fire is covered by smoke, a mirror covered by dust, embryo covered by the womb, the living entity is similarly covered by different degrees of this lust. We all are. So the pure consciousness of the living entity becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. So guys, look, I'm not saying ice cream is a bad thing, <laughs> okay? But if you eat too much of it, it's a bad thing, right? I mean, you're going to get sick. You're going to throw up. It's going to be miserable. So ice cream offered to God becomes prashadam, but ice cream, when it's just trying to enjoy it, unlimitedly becomes gluttony. And gluttony is one of the great sins. So you can say any of the great sins. It doesn't have to be gluttony. But what I'm explaining is, is that you can, you've eaten ice cream and it was good. And if you keep eating it, what happens is the tongue becomes desensitized to the ice cream. <laughs> Susan, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> become desensitized. Then you keep eating it and you're, and you're numb. Even your face is frozen. Your belly starts hurting. Before you know it, you're running to the bathroom. So this is what lust does to us. Every time we engage in lust, we're throwing another big log on the fire. And all it does is blaze higher and higher and higher and higher. It consumes everything within every just all around it. It's like these uh, robber barons who came to the USA. They just cut all the trees down, sold them all, cut, burned down everything, put a bunch of hogs in there, raised hogs and, you know, ruined it, the aquifer. I mean, they didn't care. They wanted more money, more money, more. You see what I'm saying? So there's no way that you will be satisfied ever by throwing more logs on your fire. It's just going to make a bigger fire. So the senses and the mind are the seeding places of this lust. They cover the real knowledge of the living entity and they bewilder us. So therefore, he tells Arjuna, curb this great symbol of sin or lust by regulating the senses. So yoga is meant to regulate the senses, guys. When you become, how can you be peaceful if you're running in every direction, trying to get more of this, more of that, more? You're disturbed. Your mind is disturbed. And all you're doing is implicating yourself in karmic retribution and reaction. 
So we have to bring ourselves down under the control of the intelligence. And so we're hearing this information and we're assimilating it through our intelligence. And it says the working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind and the soul is even higher than the intelligence. So thus knowing oneself to be completely transcendental to this material mind and senses and even intelligence, one should steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence and thus with spiritual strength conquer the insatiable inner enemy known as lust. Now, that's what the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is going to be directing us how to do. We're all here because we're yogis. We want to do yoga. So yoga means to yoke ourselves with the will of God. Yoke your will with, with God's will. So we have to know that what we're hearing here is the truth. We have to know that it's from the mouth of God, that it's being given to, given to us as it is through the Sampradaya from the spiritual master. And as a result, we can assimilate this knowledge into our intelligence and by that intelligence that previously sought after billions of different ways to enjoy the senses, now we can think a billion different ways to serve God in sacrifice. It's the same knife, but you're not using it to stab yourself with it. <laughs> now you're using it to cut a nice piece of fruit and offer to Krishna. Krishna will leave some fruit there for you. Don't worry, he's not going to eat it all. And even if he does, the fasting will be ecstasy. Better hope he does. That means you've actually achieved pure devotion. There are some stories like that in the Vedas. So guys, are there any questions about this chapter? I tried to go through it and kind of, you know, it's like anything else. You could read this chapter a million times. You know, I probably have. And every time I, I study this chapter, I get more and more and more and more insight and sometimes the hair stands on the end, tears start going. The revelations are powerful when you realize what you've been doing wrong. You feel repentant. You feel like, oh my God, look at me. If you look at the lives of all the, the Vaishnava Acharyas, they all start out by going, first of all, I'm the lowest among men. I'm the greatest sinner that ever was. Okay. I have no qualification to be speaking or even here. But your mercy, somehow or another, you've come to me and you've given me this liberating information. Therefore, we offer our respectful obeisances to the Lord over and over and over and over and over again and yet again. Because, guys, you've been bound up, locked in ignorance for millions of births, and you've, you've tried everything ten times. Prabhupada calls it chewing the chewed. The flavor's all gone and nothing left in it. Give it up. Let's get this right in our lifetime and become yogis, which is yoga is the art of all work. It's what Krishna describes in Bhagavad Gita. The art of all work is to offer everything back in sacrifice to the Lord. You're not giving up anything. You're still going to sit on your couch. You're still going to go to work. You're still going to eat. You're still going to drive your car. I mean, you're still going to have your family. You're not giving it up. You're just giving it to God. God's so kind that he's already given it to you and he allows you to maintain that family either with karmic reaction, if that's your will, or free from karma, if that's your will. So please exercise your free will and offer everything that you do, or everything you say, everything you give away, everything you eat, offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord. So any other questions about this chapter? Because we are now out of time due to my lack of technical ability. I wanted to do more kirtan for you, but we, we can do some more next time. I just don't want to keep you all night. Hey, Gayatri, I have two questions, and right. they're more technical, but um, when talking about the three material modes of nature, are are those like rajas, tamas, and sattva, or is that something else? No, that's it. That is okay. Yeah. And then, when talking about um, some, I'm just like I studied sankhya before, right? So this is just, but I couldn't 
make sense of it as much to a degree. And this is sort of clarifying like all of the sun kiss stuff. So then on when he talks about um, the working senses are superior to dull matter. So verse 42, okay. mind is higher than senses, intelligence is higher than mind, right? Like, so you're getting into the senses and then you're getting into the manas and then is it like booty or mahat? Yoga means the intelligence booty. Um, but so what is, what is the difference between intelligence and mind? I've... Oh, well, there's a big difference. So the mind is actually that we're, you know, the mind carries out. It's almost like a, a slave to the intelligence. Okay. So the mind is a servant to the intelligence. So the intelligence is directing the mind and the mind just goes and gets it. It's not really thinking it through. The intelligence is doing the thinking. The mind is just carrying it out. Uh, is that the senses? It's, the problem is, is when the senses dictate to the mind and the intelligence becomes bewildered, then you chase after sense enjoyment, thinking it will bring you pleasure and happiness when it's a grand illusion. So, you know, that's, that's the issue. And is, is the mind, like, if I were to just kind of a, a metaphor that I can, if I'm sitting in meditation and there's like the mind with just the thinking doing its thing, and then there's the observer which is not when I'm like in that state of bliss, right? It's not like Samadhi or anything like that, but like the observer would sort of be the intelligence. Well, the soul is above the intelligence. So the ultimate observer is the soul and the super yeah. soul. That would be the, what you're talking about. But one of the reasons why when you go to do quiet meditation, it's so difficult, especially in the Kali Yuga, because we're completely bombarded with all of these, you know, uh, sense gratificatory type distractions. So that's why we recommend, and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu recommends this uh, sankirtan, this chanting of the holy name, this kirtan, that's why we do it. Because the singing will wrap the mind in the holy name of God and purify the senses and purify the intelligence and purify the mind and so by doing that the mind becomes unobstructed by these nonsense distractions and becomes focused on that one pure true love you've been after all, all these trillions of lifetimes and now here's your opportunity to get it is there a chapter in the gita that will talk more about intel the intelligence or is there no the, all these next chapters discuss that in more detail one chapter we talked about dhyana yoga it talks about that most confidential knowledge. Uh, you know, there, there's all wonderful chapters in the Gita that describe, you know, how uh, these things can be practiced practically. And I know that's your concern, you know, because you, you're a practical girl and you want, you want to apply this information directly. So some of the things that I've said tonight, hopefully will spur you to understand how practical this karma yoga in devotion can be because whatever you do next, offer it to God. Listen, I already offered the class to God today. <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Well, that's beautiful. And we did that as well. We said, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we wanted to offer it to the Lord. We start out by inviting the Lord and doing this as our sacrifice. So this is a great sacrifice. So any other questions? Yeah, so if karma is an equal and opposite reactions, does that mean that our good actions cause evil actions? No. It means your good actions cause good reactions. So it's like an equal and same reaction. Well, yeah, but, but it means, in other words, with the force that you propel like a ball against the wall, it will bounce back, it will bounce back in the same volition and the trajectory that you threw it. That's equal and opposite reaction. But what we're talking about is you do good works, you're going to get good results. You do bad works, you're going to get bad results. If you plant uh, an apple a tree, or let's say you're going to, you want, you want some tomatoes, plant a tomato, you're going to get tomatoes. If you plant a weed, you're going to get a weed. What we're talking about here is neither one of those things are good for you because both of those things will give you another 
birth and death in the material world to suffer or enjoy the results of those activities. What we're saying is perform activities in transcendence. Transcendence means I offer all my activities to the Lord. I guess the word opposite threw me off there. Yeah, yeah. But it means, you, you know, with the same volition that you throw it in the same exact, you know, angle or whatever, it'll bounce back just like that. <laughs> Anyway, that's scientific jargon. That's not in the Vedas. Okay. Yeah. I use that. So uh, just so you could understand, because we're familiar with that terminology. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you. All right. Is anything else? Because we want to, I mean, unless you guys want to keep going, I can go all night. But, but I really appreciate you very, very much for being here and being so dedicated to hearing this philosophy. And you're going to hear these themes repeated again and again and again and again and again through 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in the in the, the second chapter, it was a whole summary. Krishna kind of went through it all. And now he's breaking it down piece by piece by piece. So this first piece um, is Karma Yoga. And then uh, I think the next chapter is Transcendental Knowledge, right? You can look it up. Susan, uh, what's is the it next chapter, Susan? The existing. Transcendental Knowledge. Yeah, Transcendental Knowledge. Thank you. So that's the next chapter. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about transcendental knowledge, jnana. What do you think about that? That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll discuss. We now we have karma, jnana, and then we get to bhakti, right? So we're going to work our way up. And uh, you guys, I really appreciate you being here and being so patient with me uh, in my humble effort. I don't know what went wrong with my. Uh, thing but i was on a meeting and you guys weren't there and i was like well, where's everybody at <laughs> <laughs> so keep me online okay i know you will susan i appreciate you being here tonight such a such a joy to see you and and everybody else guys thank you corey appreciate you you know hey listen you guys are our first class and rangavati thanks for answering all did you answer all these chats there's 16 chats on there <clears throat> did you you did she didn't do it we'll have to get her yes we did <laughs> i think we did all right, all right guys well thank you so much for being here with us and we'll post this also so if you want to watch it again you can and you know always feel free to email me at gayatri dasa at gmail d-a-s-a -S at gmail and i'll try to answer your questions you can text me on my phone number uh or call me or get in touch with rangavati or go to my facebook whatever you want we're always here for you. And uh, we'll have another, oh, hey, we got a big thing coming up at Happy Go Yogi for Nishringa Day's appearance. And uh, it'd be great if you guys could come. It's a, we're going to be discussing that whole story in the Srimad Bhagavad. That's an amazing story about an incarnation of God as half man, half lion to protect Prahlad Maharaj. And then we're going to do it again on Thursday at Marari Farm. And anybody, if anybody could come to actual Marari Farm, it's quite a distance for some of you guys. But we're going to do it again down there. So guys, I'm, I'm here for you and I'm, I'm grateful for you. And I guess I'll sign off at this point. All right. Thank you, Babu. Krishna. Very Krishna guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you again soon. Okay. Hare Krishna.